you're falling on your knees. We're falling on our knees, offering all of these. Isn't that what we just sang? It's a nice song, isn't it? Is it a challenge? Every day? To offer all that we are to the Lord? It is. It starts with a decision. It starts with a decision. Can you say decision? decision. Most things start with a decision. How many of you are married? How I many just woke up one morning and found yourself married? Stay home I gotta tell you, I was driving down the road with Rhonda in the passenger seat. She opens the glove box and finds a ring in the glove department. What do you do then? Okay. Sometimes God can move along our decisions. Um, But I want to share a scripture with you this morning. I've been on for a couple of weeks. And it talks about this offering of all that we are to the Lord. Romans 12. You know, there's verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Folks, did you worship this morning? Well, some of you think you might have. Did you worship this morning? Yes. Okay, a little better. All right, maybe. We've come together to worship the Lord together. To worship the Lord. To lift Him up. To <coughs> exalt Him. To honor Him. But it's not just through our lip service. It's not just the feeling of our heart that we adore Him. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What we do outside this sanctuary is as much worship as what we do in this sanctuary. Yeah. Can I say that? I think I just did. Our spiritual act of worship is our living sacrifice. It's not just our sacrifice for an hour or two on Sunday morning and maybe once or twice during the week. We worship the Lord continually through our living sacrifice. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. <coughs> Last week I used the phrase monkey see, monkey do, but do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And last week I, I encouraged us to focus on Jesus Christ. To allow His image. His form penetrate us to be like Him, to have His Spirit within us. Then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Jesus was good and pleasing and perfect. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Read this one with me. Would you, this, this, this one line? For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Let's see, was Paul leading some people out there? Talking to the church in Rome. The church. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judge, judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, aren't you glad? So in Christ, we who are many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. Is that a scary thought? Each member belongs to all the others? We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let them govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let them do it cheerfully. Let me repeat verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment 
in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Paul says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Let me start by saying, Paul is speaking from an attitude of grace. Paul is speaking to the church in Rome from an attitude of grace. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved, and this by faith, not, not by works that no man can boast. So Paul is saying, Here, uh, there's grace that I'm coming from, and we've all received this grace if we're in Christ. First Timothy 1.15, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Did you know that? He didn't come to save those who were well. He came to, to minister to those who were sick. He came to save sinners. To save us. From what? From hell? Eternal damnation? From the spirit of this world? That rules our life? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul goes on to say, of whom I am the worst. Paul says, I'm the worst sinner. I could stand up in the sanctuary this morning and look at it once you and say, man, I'm the worst sinner in here. I've done things, I've thought things that I'm so disgraced by. And so he speaks from an attitude of grace. For by the grace of me, I just say to every one of you, he's addressing them in grace. Secondly, he's addressing them from a position, from a position of grace. Romans chapter 1 verse 1 starts like this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul has a position <coughs> as an apostle, as one who has seen Jesus, although through a vision, and one who communicates who Jesus is, the gospel of Christ, of Christ, the good news to the world. He preaches. Amen. Romans 12, 6, says this. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, did you hear that? Since we have gifts that differ, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them in common. We have prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. Paul saying he has a position as an apostle, and it's by grace. So Paul not only speaks to them from an attitude of grace, one who has been saved by grace, he always speaks to them from a position of grace as one who has been called, who has been placed in the body as an apostle. Ephesians 3.1, Paul speaks to the church in Ephesus and he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, he was in prison for the sake of the gospel, and if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which has been given to me, so he looks at this stewardship of God's grace as a position, as a stewardship, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been revealed by his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ. Let's see, who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews. Okay? And they are fellow heirs. Okay? Of the gospel of Christ. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which has, was given to me according to the working of His power. It's God's power that is working in Paul's life. And so, I repeat verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. 
Don't think of yourselves as more highly than you are. Look at the person next to you and say, don't think of yourself as more highly than you are. I dare you. Go ahead. <laughs> don't think of yourself as more highly than you are. There's a few stickers out there. What's it mean to think more highly of yourself than you are? Trying to be puffed up? Maybe a little conceited? I'm, I, I don't like to pick on anybody too much, but I'm the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game! Um, <laughs> so we pray for one another. Don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Than you are. But rather think of yourself as sober judgment. Sober judgment. Can success go to our heads? Can success go to our heads? There's a lot of different ways we can be successful. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul is addressing another issue kind of related. It says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Now, if we spoke to most of the world, they would say that everyone sitting in this sanctuary this morning is rich. It's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Okay? So we're not to become conceited and to fix our hope on the uncertainty of riches. What do you mean, fix your hope? on the uncertainty of riches. It means we just don't trust that the abundance we have, that that's always going to be there. That somehow we, we created that abundance out of our own abilities. But we're to fix our hope on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. That's who we're to fix our hope on, on God, who supplies all things for us to enjoy. In the body. If we have gifts, that God has given to us, don't fix our hope on ourselves. If we have a position in the body that we've been given by God, that's been assigned to us, don't, don't say, oh, well, I've got this position, so I, that makes me a great person. No. God's the one that makes us fruitful. God's the one that supplies what we need for our ministries. God supplies our gift. We're to fix our hope on Him. We're to recognize the source of all of our success, all of our position, all of our abilities. And you can say, you know, I worked hard to get that job. But I'll tell you, unless God gave you the strength, unless God gave you the breath, unless God gave you the talents, unless God gave you the mind, you wouldn't be working. And sometimes we can realize, just like that, how quickly those things can be taken from us. We need those other things disappear. Our power, our position, our abilities, they're gifts from the Lord. And we have to be careful about becoming puffed up because God has gifted us, or God has made us successful. Um, Paul gives a warning. In 1 Timothy 3, 1, it says, If anyone sets his heart on being an, an overseer, a leader in the church. He desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. Hey, listen. God puts some qualifications on those that he, he has in position, okay? Just so you know, there's qualifications. Uh, for the worship team, Colby well, we had to fill out a form and talk about qualifications a little bit. And then... Uh, when the form was lost, he had to fill it out again, but we won't go there. <laughs> he didn't lose it, okay? He didn't lose it. Now the overseer must be above reproach. <coughs> the husband of but one wife. Some of you are saying, I can't imagine having two, but the husband of one wife. <laughs> Temperate, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well. And see that his children obey him with proper respect. 
If anyone was, does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Listen to this, verse 6. He says, he must not be a recent convert. What's a recent convert? A new believer? Someone who's just recently come to know the Lord, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior? Must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited. A position? An anointing? Success that God gives? Position that God gives can cause us to be, con be conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. A person can go from being a new believer to incurring the same judgment as the devil because of being conceited, being prideful. They must first be tested, and then, if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Let them first be tested. Give them a little responsibility. See if they can handle that without becoming puffed up. Okay? Even our righteousness, our cleansing, can water that root of pride that may be planted within us. And so, the Apostle Paul says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Okay? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. If we are thinking of ourselves highly, you know, uh, it's been said that uh, God made it so it wasn't too easy for us to pat ourselves on the back and too easy for us to kick ourselves either. Um, but if we think of ourselves too highly, how can we bring, how can we fulfill the purpose God's made us for? And that's to bring Him glory. If we're trying to bring ourselves glory. Okay? Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Does this happen overnight, folks? That one day you come to the Lord, and the next day everything you do is for God's glory, and we no longer seek, uh, seek any attention for it. We don't wait for somebody to thank us. We don't wait for the card to come in the mail. Uh, we don't see who's looking uh, around. There's a story of a woman on the East Coast, and she was at a, a convenience store. She was playing this video game. And she was racking up the points on this video game. He just astronomical, and he got so high she's breaking all the records everywhere. And so they called in a TV press crew, and they came in, and she was still racking up the points, and she was kind of glad that this TV coverage was there. And tell one of the people on the camera crew, take the extension cord that plugged the video game in, and everything went blank on the video screen. And she wasn't too happy about all the attention she was getting, but pride goes before the fall. The scripture says, the word of, let our light shine before man in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And sometimes we've got to grow into that a little bit, right? And I think, honestly, I'll probably be growing into that till the day I die. To God, I want you to have the glory. I don't want to be seeking the affirmation for myself. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. It's about the time you're trying to show off, it's about the time you're going to trip, isn't it? Oh, I hope she's looking at me over here. Yeah, you've never done that, that long. I know. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. God lifts up the humble. And Paul is encouraging them to stay humble. Don't get conceited. That God may be glorified. See if you can figure out who wrote this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. 
We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings, blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue, virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. Who wants to guess who wrote that? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to pray that you stay humble after guessing it, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so he proclaimed the National Day for Humiliation, Fasting, and Prayer in 1863. And in May, we will have another National Day of Prayer. There's a story of a little pond down on a farm, and the, the ducks used to play in the pond, and the ducks would play with the frog in the pond. And in the summertime, when they got really hot, the, uh, the pond would dry up. No problem for the ducks to get out of town, but the frog stuck in the mud. And so uh, the ducks had a pretty good system. They would put uh, uh, in their bill between them, they'd put a stick, and then the frog would hold on with his mouth. Well, one summer it got hot, they put their stick in their bill, the frog jumped on and held on with his mouth. And they flew off, and another farmer saw them fly overhead and said, Man, that looks like a really bright idea. Whose idea was that? And the frog said, I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> the scripture says, Don't let your own mouth praise you, but that of another. Christ goes before the fall. Uh, President Ronald Reagan was in Mexico and he was giving a speech. I believe it was in Mexico. I, I should qualify that. But he was giving a speech and uh, nobody responded to it hardly at all. And deflating probably if, if it were me and nobody ever responded. I, you know, could be. And, uh, and then the next person got up to speak. Of course, he spoke in Spanish. Oh, the people were clapping at every word and cheering him on. And so, President Reagan didn't speak Spanish, but he thought, you know what, I'm going to lift this guy up. I mean, they didn't clap for me, but I'm going to clap for him. So he would clap louder and harder than everybody else there. And finally, his, uh, his associate uh, leaned over to him and said, I don't think that's a good idea. Why not? The president said, well, he's interpreting your speech. <laughs> he's clapping for himself! Cheering for himself more than anybody else! <laughs> he didn't know it. But we know it when we do it. It's been said something like, uh, pride is the only disease that uh, makes everybody sick around you except for yourself. I'm prideful, I'm not sick, everybody else is sick of it, right? So we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ as the one who has given us the gift of grace, who has saved us. We don't deserve to be in the body of Christ, who has given us the gifting and the position in his body if we have such, or just the spiritual maturity that we don't look at others and say, oh, well, I'm not like him, you know, because God desires for us to remain humble. For the, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. There's many times in the scriptures that uh, the word calls us not to be drunkards, not to be intoxicated with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit, to be sober in spirit for the purpose of prayer. And Paul calls us to pray continually. And there's things in this life that can impair our judgment. Not just the things we drink or smoke, or the uh, medications that we take uh, which are no longer under prescription, but the things like wealth, 
success, and even God's blessing upon us can impair our judgment and puff us up. And can He easily deflate us? Yes, He can. So can damage be done in the meantime? Yes, it can. Because we've been called to be one body. We've been called to be one body. Jesus said, uh, Abide me and my word abides in you and you'll produce much fruit. But he says to us, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And we're to minister out of the measure of faith that God has given us. Any of the spiritual gifts that we may have, whether it's uh, being a, an apostle, being a teacher, being a servant, being an administrator, whatever it might be, it takes faith to fulfill those things. You can't teach a Sunday school lesson without having faith that you're teaching the truth of words God, God's Word. And then it can bring salvation to your students. But we've all been given a measure of faith. Now, how many of you buy bulk foods? Okay, some of you admit it. Okay? I buy bulk foods. Now, number 1961 is my bulk food item at Winko. Uh, wasabi? It's got the wasabi peas in it and these uh, other <coughs> breaded things in this bag. And so, number 1961 is code. Well, it's my birthday. I can remember that one when I go to throw it out. I can remember 1961. I can remember the Elephant's Corner uh, Sunday God phone number because it's 556 1961. You know, it's easy. But when I get my wasabi peas and bread mix thing, trail mix thing, whatever it is, I put in the bag and I measure out <coughs> what I think that bag can hold because there's more than me in the household that eat it. And so I, I fill that little large plastic bag pretty good and spin it and tie it up and put it in, but I measure it out. God apportions to each one of us a measure of faith. He has gifts for each one of us. None of us should think of ourselves as more highly than another. In Philippians 2, Paul writes and says, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who considered others more important than himself. It doesn't matter the position. It doesn't matter the gifting. We are here because we belong to one another, to serve one another, to build up the body of Christ, to glorify God. Amen. It's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about Him. And it's about us. And it's about doing His will. We, we sang many beautiful songs this morning. Amazing grace and such many songs of worship. But until we sing, you know, um, we, we give our lives a sacrifice, we, we bow down, and we talk about our consecration to the Lord as far as His service. We have called, we've been called to be His servants, and to do that, we have to serve humbly together so that everybody around us doesn't become sick of us, not want to work with us. So that we can lift up others. You know, usually people that are lifting themselves up aren't very good at lifting up others. And I'm sure I'm guilty of that. And I can grow in that area. Um, there's one pastor. How many of you know Pastor John Kuykendall? He is the most affirming pastor. And he just convicts me when I'm around because he's always lifting me up. And inspires me to want to be better at lifting up those around me in the body. Sober judgment is judgment that realizes that we are in the body of Christ through grace. It's God's beautiful gift, His kindness to us, that Christ would die on the cross for my sins and for yours. We have a position that He has given to us. We have a gifting that He's given to us. And it's by grace. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. 
It's a gift. Praise the Lord. It keeps us in a humble attitude that we might serve in the body. Now we sing Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. How many of you sing that? I'm not sure everybody's found yet. I'm talking about in the body of Christ. I think some people are still hiding. They've got their gift and they're hiding it. If they don't find out what my gift is, they won't ask me to use it. You know what I mean? Are we a living sacrifice or are we hiding out? Are we a living sacrifice that we consecrate our lives for the Lord's service? Or are we saying, ah, Lord, thanks, but I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to go home and play with it. Okay? This morning, this passage is a portrait of the church. A church that is surrendered to God. A church that is consecrated, is, is pledging to live a holy life surrendered to God. A, a, a living sacrifice. One that has received Jesus Christ and has been made alive in His Spirit. With the understanding that we're just not saved to sit here on a Sunday morning and sing a few worship songs. We're not saved just to sit here on a Sunday morning and sing a few worship songs. We're saved to be a living sacrifice. It's our spiritual worship to use the talents, the abilities, the gifting that God has given us in cooperation with the body of Christ to accomplish His work, His ministry, to build up the church and to expand the kingdom. Are you on board? What? Yes. Are you on board? Yes. Like the coach saying, okay, it's time to play football. Who wants to play today? How about some retired kicker from Tacoma, Washington that says, or quarterback from Tacoma, Washington says, oh, well, the quarterback may not be able to play. He's been injured. And if you need me to step in, even for, a, even for one down, I, I know the plays. I, I play professional football. I play with the team. And, you know, I'll stop my teaching for this week at, uh, at the high school here, and I'll come play for you because I, I, I still want to be part of the team. Even though I've been retired, I still want to be part of the team. And I bet he was enthusiastic when he got to sit on the sidelines. I bet his students were enthusiastic to watch me. You know there's people watching us? You know there's people watching us? There are people watching you. Are we a living sacrifice that is humbly willing to serve in the body of Christ? You know, pride's an interesting thing. When we're working for our own recognition, that means we're we know that we're utilizing our own skills and abilities and say, hey, look at me, look, look at how good I am. Do you realize fear <coughs> comes from the same place? Do you realize fear comes from the same place? When we're dependent on our own strength and our own abilities, i got to good news for you this morning. When God gives you, He empowers you, and what you do for Him, you don't do on your own strength alone. We don't have to be afraid. Yeah. We can overcome that fear. We can move beyond it. We can be courageous because it's God that's working in us. And some of us think, you know, I'd love to do that, but I can never do that. No, Apostle Paul, sorry, you see it. Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God calls you to it, He'll gift you for it. He'll empower you for it. Don't make excuses. I'm calling us to be the body of Christ. And I'm speaking as Paul spoke to everyone that's listening. To everyone that's listening to this morning this morning. Are you a living sacrifice? Have you received Christ as your Savior? Have you asked Him to forgive you of your sins? Will you allow Him to use you? Not just on Sunday morning here for an hour, but to be His vessel throughout the week. To minister and to be part of the body of Christ. I want to tell you something this morning. You can attend here 
You can attend there, you can attend everywhere you want, and you're welcome to attend. You're welcome to go from this church to that church, whatever. That's fine with me. But I cannot bestow a ministry upon you until you make a commitment to this congregation. Does that make sense? If you want to have a ministry here in this local body, I need to know that you're plugging in, that you're making a commitment. And so I encourage you, if you don't have a church, I encourage you to find a church. That doesn't mean we don't cooperate across church lines. We definitely do. We're the body of Christ. Does that make sense? But some of us need to make a decision then. God, where do I serve? How do I serve? And if you're looking for a place in the body to serve, come talk to me. Talk to Pastor Julie. Talk to one of the ministry leaders. So the class I'm going through right now, uh, that used to be Jerry's class, we're going through as far as finding our spiritual gifts, and I'll be offering that later uh, to everyone in the church and to our, to our council members and to our board members, because they're the ones I'm going to be sending you to, and I'll let you know right now if they don't know already. Uh, if that's your area of ministry that they're over, to help you find a place of service in that ministry, because we want to be the body of Christ. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. That measure of faith that God has given us. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. But if you're the best mercy giver in the world, don't get conceited about it. Oh, I'm better giving mercy than they are. Well, you should be, because that's probably your gift. I'm, I'm a better giver than all these people together. Well, you should be, if that's your gift. Be the best you can be for the Lord. But say, I'm great at giving mercy because I've experienced the mercy of Jesus Christ. I'm great at giving because of how gracious God has been in giving me. And I'm just passing it on. Amen. Let's stand together as a worship team comes forward.